news from here in Taiwan and around the world. A Taiwan court has rejected appeals by four suspects in a corruption scandal that's gripping the nation. Harrell Hughes reports from Taiwan's High Court. Taiwan's High Court is standing firm on the decision to detain four suspects in Comunicado while they're being investigated for corruption over a development project here in Taipei. The court has rejected their appeals to be released while the investigation is ongoing. It's the latest in a corruption case that's gripped Taiwan, involving former Taipei mayor and Taiwan People's Party founder Ko Wenja. Ko was arrested for the second time earlier this week and is now being held incommunicado at a detention center in Taipei. The court's decision is final for these four people, Ko's deputy mayor, the chair of the development project, and two others involved in the case. The court says there is evidence they tried to tamper with evidence and collude with other defendants in the case. So it's necessary for them to continue being detained. They'll now be held incommunicado throughout the investigation. Now, Ko Wenja himself has not filed an appeal for release. But if he plans to do so, the high court's decision for his associates does not bode well for him as prosecutors build their case over the next two months. Ryan Wu and Harrell Hughes in Taipei for Taiwan Plus. Ko's supporters have launched what they call a quiet revolution outside the detention center where he's being held. They're criticizing his arrest that's linked to the corruption scandal during his time as mayor. Ko founded Taiwan's third largest political party and ran for president in this year's election. Ko's wife, Chen Peiqi, was among supporters defending his innocence. Police in Taiwan are warning against online fraudsters pretending to be celebrities. Authorities say scammers have been using social media to pose as famous authors. They ask people to give their personal information for fake book deals and then use it to commit investment fraud. Police say social media algorithms make it easier for scammers to find potential targets. 这个脸书广告它的演算法就会推荐这些内容去给这个受众目标，那也相对这些民众就会更容易去点击到这种啊诈骗广告。The U.S. has once again named Taiwan's fishing industry in a report on forced labor. Here's how Taiwanese officials have responded. 我们积极在推动一夜年前计划，因为我们整整体推动一夜年前计划，整体从制度变、从薪资变、从茶叶变，我们都在积极推动，积极跟美方来说明我们的这种情形，美方有来看呐，看我们推动情情况。It's the third time Taiwan's fishing industry has been on the U.S. blacklist of goods produced by child labor or forced labor. The country's fisheries are worth billions of dollars and rely heavily on foreign migrant workers. For years, the industry has been plagued by accusations of abuse on fishing vessels. China will no longer send its children abroad for adoption. Thousands of families across the world have adopted Chinese children over the past 30 years. Now Beijing's turnaround is causing heartache for families who've been hoping to adopt. Wesley Lewis reports. China will no longer allow children from the country to be adopted by non-Chinese nationals overseas. Beijing says the change in policy is in line with international trends concerning adoption. For three decades, foreign families have adopted Chinese children after the country permitted the practice in 1992. Between 1979 and 2015, China's one-child policy restricted family sizes, and many parents chose to give up children for adoption. Over 80,000 children, mostly girls, were adopted by families in the U.S., the most of any country. And this change in policy has left hundreds of families at various stages of adoption in limbo. 
as it's a process that typically takes several years. Families like the Welches from Louisville, Kentucky, who successfully adopted one child from China and began the process to adopt another in 2019. Um, it was actually five years ago this month that we were matched with a little girl named that we call Penelope. Um, she was five years old at the time, and um, she has a sensitive medical need, which makes it almost impossible for her to be adopted where she is. China suspended foreign adoptions during the COVID-19 pandemic, but later resumed them. The Welches say they had completed all the paperwork and started preparing for their adoptive daughter's arrival. We prepared, we bought new clothes for her. Her bed has been ready since January of 2019. Um, we worked on language. We practiced making Chinese food that she would like. We did all of the things and we were ready, but the call never came. Adoption agencies in the U.S. say the policy change is clear and it means ongoing adoption cases are going to be terminated. I'm, I, I'm not going to stop advocating, and I, I hope others won't either, but the communication that we got was clear. Uh, the, the ministry spokeswoman um, in China made it very clear that they are ending adoptions, and the notice that was given um, to the Department of State said that included pending adoptions. The Welches say they plan to appeal the decision and advocate for other children and families with pending adoptions. The move to end foreign adoptions comes as China's birth rate continues to decline. Last year, the number of Chinese newborns dropped to around 9 million, while the overall population shrunk for the second year in a row. Beijing knows that its former birth control measures have led to fewer young people having to support a massive aging population. For this reason, China's previously unwanted children are now seen as future assets it would rather keep hold of. Alex Chen and Wesley Lewis for Taiwan Plus. The president of the World Bank is in Tuvalu, a Pacific Island nation whose very existence is threatened by climate change. Now Ajay Banga is calling for more help for the nation's young people as they grapple with the effects of a warming planet. Ajay Banga, a little more than a year into his job as president of the World Bank, has made climate change part of the global lender's remit. Now he's traveled to Tuvalu, a small island nation that's on the front lines of rising sea levels. It's, it is so obvious on the ground here that they don't have a problem with creating uh, emission-heavy kind of growth. They're basically suffering from the impact of climate change and what it's doing to them. Scientists estimate that by 2050, half of Tuvalu's capital, Funafuti, will be flooded on a daily basis. To survive, Tuvalu is building seawalls and reclaiming land. But Banga says what's needed is more than just physical infrastructure. It's also about human infrastructure and helping them have the quality of life that they deserve and they need. If Tuvalu's islands become uninhabitable, its population of 11,000 would be forced to move. Banga says he wants to see the World Bank train Tuvalu's young people in professional skills like nursing and plumbing that could help them migrate to other countries. Tuvalu already has a deal with Australia that allows almost 300 Tuvaluans to move there each year, a pathway that many of the young here are eyeing. We don't have a plan to move somewhere else, like another country. Maybe Australia. That's, that's the plan. But not everyone is willing to leave. I love my country, I love my home, and I love doing what I do every day in Tuvalu. And I wish to stay. I wish to remain here on the island. I wish my, for my children to experience the same life that I live. While Tuvaluans hope they can stay on their land, they're preparing for a future in which they have no choice but to leave because sea levels keep on rising. Scott Huang and Louise Watt for Taiwan Plus. A village in Taiwan South is working to restore traditions almost lost to time and give the local elderly community the opportunity to show off their skills and preserve their culture. Louise Ayers reports. Rows of pea green tobacco plants, bringing back a splash of color to this southern Taiwanese village. Lu Man was once a key area for tobacco farming in Taiwan, but the industry saw a decline as the local population aged. 
Now, renewed efforts from the community are helping revive traditional agricultural practices. It's part of a wider push in the village to restore local traditions almost lost to time. In addition to growing tobacco, the area also has a musical history. Local instrument makers are invited to host workshops and to show off skills they've learned over the decades and more sustainable approaches they've embraced in their age-old crafts. For many elderly members of the community, the Luman Cultural Restoration Project has provided a new sense of purpose and vitality, while also helping preserve once endangered local traditions. Andy Xue and Reese's for Taiwan Plus. Taiwanese badminton great Dai Ziying has been knocked out of the Taipei Open. She lost to Indonesia's Putri Kusama Wardani in the women's singles quarterfinal. Dai says she's not disappointed with the result as she's still recovering from a knee injury. The former world number one plans to retire by the end of this year. Taiwan's ultramarathon champion Tommy Chen has come first in a 230-kilometer race in Kenya. Chen finished first in the men's division of the Four Rangers Ultra. He finished the five-day race in around 21 hours. Participants had to run a distance equivalent to one marathon each day. Competitors ran through a wildlife reserve and faced changing climates and high altitudes. A record number of dolphins and whales are washing up on Taiwan's beaches every year, and a group of volunteers is doing its best to respond. Harrell Hughes reports. On a beach in northeastern Taiwan, an unwelcome sight. A dwarf sperm whale struggling on the sand, and a group of volunteers racing to save its life. They've been trained by marine conservation organization, the Taiwan Cetacean Society. Because, uh, the organization has attracted conservationists and animal lovers, like Joanna Hung, a salesperson from Taipei, who learned how to respond to marine animals in need. It's not uncommon to come across injured marine life in Taiwan, from beached whales and dolphins to injured sea turtles. But in recent years, researchers are seeing a rise in the number of stranding incidents from 40 to 60 per year in the past, up to 90. And we have evidence that uh, shipping, uh, shipping traffic and fishing and even pollution play a very big role. Responding to this trend has been a challenge. And the majority of animals that become beached on Taiwan's shores do not survive, including, sadly, this dwarf sperm whale. But for the Taiwan Cetacean Society and its volunteers like Joanna, giving washed up whales and dolphins a fighting chance makes the effort worthwhile. Ethan Pan and Harrell Hughes for Taiwan Plus. Thank you for watching What's Up Taiwan. Do visit the Taiwan Plus website or follow our social media for more stories from Taiwan and around the world. We'll play out with some images of twin baby elephants in southern Myanmar. I'm Louise Watt. Take care. We'll see you next time.